welcome to the latest Niskanen webinar on climate. I'm Liza Reed. I'm the research manager for low carbon technology policy uh, here at the Niskanen Center. We're a DC based think tank uh, and advocacy group. We've been focusing on climate change and policy mechanisms for reducing emissions for a number of years now. And we're gonna continue that conversation today. Uh, the topic today is deep decarbonization of the U.S. industrial sector. This has been identified by many as the hardest part of the economy to decarbonize. My colleague, Nader Sobani, recently published a paper that describes some of these challenges and some of the opportunities for how they can be addressed. Uh, so he's going to provide, present that paper and some of his analysis. Uh, and include, and then we'll have a discussion around what those solutions entail. There's economic impacts, technical implications, and then regional, uh, regional implications as well. Joining Nader for that discussion uh, is uh, Kate Height, the Chief Operating Officer of the Mission Possible Partnership and Principal at RMI. Spencer Nelson, Senior Research Director at ClearPath and Richard Middleton, CEO and co-founder of Carbon Solutions. So I'm gonna ask Nader to kick us off here uh, with a bit of an intro uh, and overview of his paper. We'll also provide that in the chat for folks who wanna follow up with the full 40 page details. Nader, do you wanna share your screen sure, and, uh, sure. and get us started? Thanks, Thanks Liza. So much. Uh, thank you everyone joining virtually and thank you to the other panelists, uh, really looking forward to the discussion. So let me just share my slides. Great, hopefully you all can see that now. Um, so we at the Niskanen Center published the paper last month that evaluates the regional economic and technical realities of decarbonizing industry um, in the hopes that it would provide a blueprint for uh, addressing the source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So in order to reach mid-century decarbonization goals, we're gonna need to reduce emissions from all sectors of the economy. Currently, the industrial sector makes up about a fourth of total US greenhouse gas emissions, and its share of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is expected to increase over the coming years. Unlike other sectors, the technologies uh, that are critical to decarbonizing industry are still not commercially viable and uh, they are far away from it. So there's a big role for policy to play in order to help bring down the costs of these technologies and scale them in a timely manner if we're going to reduce emissions uh, and meet mid-century goals. So we begin our analysis by trying to understand the geographic distribution of emissions across uh, the US. So the uh, sectors we looked at were chemical manufacturing, metal manufacturing, mineral manufacturing, as well as pulp and paper production. And as you can see on this map, uh, emissions from certain sectors are located and concentrated in certain regions of the US. So emissions from chemical manufacturing are concentrated to states around the Gulf Coast, whereas um, metal manufacturing emissions are concentrated uh, within states around the Great Lakes. Mineral manufacturing emissions are much more evenly distributed across the US. So um, this kind of gives us an idea of where we need to concentrate our efforts and resources if we're gonna start reducing emissions from the industrial sector. We did a similar mapping for economic activity coming from these sectors. So we looked at both the share of GDP coming from these sectors uh, per state, as well as share of employment coming from these sectors. And again, you have uh, certain hotspots. So for example, Louisiana, Indiana, Ohio, Alabama, these are states that get a high share of both GDP and employment um, from the evaluated sectors. And this is uh, useful information for two reasons. One, uh, it's important to know which states have a high level of economic entanglement coming from the in industri industrial sector because that presents you know, barriers or could present barriers and challenges to building policy momentum around reducing these emissions. And it also, the second reason it's important is because it could provide insight into the sorts of coalitions we need to build within these states if we're gonna build policy momentum. So for example, within Louisiana, we know we're gonna need to speak to the business community. We know we're gonna speak to uh, labor groups. Um, 
And uh, we need to include a wide variety of stakeholders if we are going to build policy momentum around reducing industrial sector emissions. So in the paper, we also uh, highlighted a few technologies that are critical to reducing industrial sector emissions, such as carbon capture, electrification, and zero carbon hydrogen. And the application of these technologies really does depend on local characteristics, such as the availability of low cost zero carbon electricity, the availability of carbon storage sequestration sites and complementary infrastructure such as CO2 pipelines. And because these characteristics vary from region to region, strategies to decarbonize industry will also vary region to region. So I just wanna walk you all through an example of how we use all this information in the paper. So what you see here are emissions from ammonia manufacturing facilities across the US. And you can see that Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Iowa are hotspots for this source of emissions. Now, this is an image pulled from a McKinsey report on decarbonizing industry. And what you see to the left are the technology options for addressing uh, emissions from these facilities. And what you see to the right is a graph of the zero carbon electricity price points at which each of these technologies becomes cost competitive with one another. So for example, at around at $35 per megawatt hour and below, um, zero carbon hydrogen actually becomes more cost competitive as an abatement strategy than applying carbon capture to these facilities. And keeping with uh, the McKinsey tradition, they've also supplied negative uh, uh, decarbonization costs. So they found that at below around $25 per megawatt hour, using electrolysis derived hydrogen or zero carbon hydrogen to manufacture ammonia is cost competitive with conventional methods of producing ammonia. So we know that Iowa and Oklahoma, for example, are hotspots uh, to decarbon, uh, are hotspots for ammonia manufacturing emissions. Um, and they also have some of the best onshore wind resources in the US. Not only that, but they also have some of the cheapest wind resources in the US. So the, this map to the right shows you wind PPA prices by region or in, in each region. And um, because of how cheap onshore wind is there, it would make sense to pursue zero carbon hydrogen or electrification as a way to decarbonize chemical facilities in, that, in those states. Louisiana, on the other hand, has a very little onshore wind technical potential and has virtually zero renewable resources and their offshore wind resources are not at all developed. So we need another strategy to decarbonize those facilities uh, within that state. What Louisiana does have are excellent carbon sequestration resources and sites. So it has some of the best CO2 storage potential of anywhere in the US. It also has already a relatively robust network of CO2 pipelines. So this map uh, right here shows you the Denbury Green Pipeline, which is already taking um, captured CO2 from industrial facilities to enhance oil recovery sites in Mississippi. Um, so this is just an example of how for the same sector, decarbonization strategies and technologies might differ because of these local characteristics. Now, one other thing I'd like to point out is that um, in St. Charles Parish and Ascension Parish, which are counties essentially in Louisiana, located in this portion of the state, more than 10% of these counties workforce is in chemical manufacturing. So this is a reality we need to grapple with when trying to design policy to transition in uh, Louisiana's uh, industrial sector. If we're gonna have a robust workforce in a low carbon industrial system, we need to take into account these realities. So the main takeaways of this paper are that critical technologies to reduce industrial sector emissions include carbon capture, electrification, and zero carbon hydrogen. Um, the application of these technologies is going to uh, vary and must be, is going to vary because of the variation in local characteristics, such as the availability of uh, low cost zero carbon electricity, the availability of carbon sequestration sites nearby, as well as complementary infrastructure such as CO2 pipelines. And because these characteristics vary region to region, decarbonization strategies are going to vary region to region and policy needs to account for this. So just some themes that policy should 
to consider when, look, when we're designing policy to reduce industrial sector emissions. We need to leverage regional characteristics such as CO2 storage capacity and cheap renewable electricity where they are most available. We need to create a robust innovation environment to help fund basic R&D and move pilot phase technology to commercial markets. And we need to incentivize a wide basket of technologies precisely because uh, strategies and technologies are gonna vary region to region, sector to sector, and even sometimes within states. Uh, so it's important we incentivize a wide basket of technologies uh, when designing policy. And uh, for the research community, we need continued investment and funding in this area of research uh, it'd be great to better understand kind of what are the employment effects of this transition? What is this relationship between state action plans and federal policy? Um, so I'm hoping we can speak to some of these points and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nader, for that great overview. I really do encourage folks to uh, download the paper and, and dive into some more of the details that Nader so succinctly laid out here. Uh, and to his point, we're just gonna dive right into questions. Just so attendees know, we do have an abbreviated webinar today. We're just going 45 minutes. So please submit your questions to the Q&A. We will get to as many as we can, uh, but we might not be able to get to everything. And I just wanted to give folks a heads up on our, on our timeline. So diving in, uh, Kate, the burning question of the day, what is it going to take to decarbonize the industry? You have a lot of experience working with industry. Right, being in these conversations about what challenges they're facing. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, it, what you're hearing from industry and, and what they see as the challenges uh, to face here? Sure, I'd be glad to, Liza. And thanks for inviting me to join today. Um, this is a really important conversation that comes at a really pivotal time in the US policy landscape. So the, the reason why industrial emissions have long been kind of the third rail of climate policy um, is for a number of reasons that, um, that Nader dives into pretty deeply in his paper. I think those maps of sort of GDP by state and job impacts are a huge part of that, right? And I think this is not only in the US, but it's kind of across geographies. We've seen this um, sort of question of industrial competitiveness across borders, across state borders, across national borders, as really being um, in the past has been sort of a big impediment to action. I think, however, there is a new recognition in the international space and domestically that it is not only possible, but essential if we're going to be tackling any of the climate um, challenges that we have before us in this decade, which is a really crucial one for us. So I think that um, you know, we, there's some really exciting conversation happening on the Hill right now um, with regard to how we might be able to embed um, some of this industrial transition and some of the infrastructure investments that our government will be making in the next several months. But I think in addition, there's like this really wonderful opportunity to really um, move the conversation from the national commitment landscape to the sector commitment landscape. And what does it look like, look like to harmonize national policies across borders? So the incentives for industries in different countries are all aligned in the same direction. So I work with a, a team of organizations um, called the Mission Possible Partnership, and we're trying to do exactly that. So sort of align the forces to point toward industrial decarbonization in seven key sectors, which are responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. So looking at some of the biggies um, that Nader covered in his paper. So on materials, we've got steel, aluminum, chemicals, and concrete. And then we have three big transport sectors with aviation, shipping, and steel, right? These are all big ones. They're responsible for 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. If they continue business as usual, they will absorb in this decade the remaining carbon budget we have going out to 2050. So it is not a choice on whether or not these sectors take action. It's a matter of how quickly it will happen, right? So what is necessary right now, and this is something that I think the USG is really aligning around, is a clear roadmap for each of these sectors on what it's going to take to decarbonize. This roadmap needs to be backed by the industry players themselves 
who are able to articulate that this is indeed achievable and they are building this into industrial strategies. But it's also going to take an entire stakeholder ecosystem to make this happen. So certainly you can have industries saying that they wanna do good things, but unless they're supported by customers who are going to demand those products, by banks who are gonna support those transitions and by governments putting in place supportive policy, it's going to continue to be a challenge. So what we're trying to do in the partnership here is to really align that whole flywheel of stakeholders pointed in that same direction so we can make some progress. And I think that we have a really exciting opportunity um, in the US right now with the position that we're in, this opportunity to build back better um, that is really unprecedented. And we're seeing the, the administration incorporate into every single agency a very clear agenda pointed toward um, emissions abatement. Thank you, Kate. That's really insightful. You know, the, I, I liked your point about sectoral and not national boundaries, right? And how we think about these industries working together, uh, bringing all the stakeholders to the table, obviously incredibly important because it's not, uh, maybe not reasonable to ask manufacturers of chemicals or metals to suddenly become experts in carbon capture and sequestration, right? I mean, that's literally another industry. Uh, and so I actually I'm gonna use that as a segue. Um, Richard, if you wanna share a little bit about this technology, about carbon capture and sequestration, I know you've done a lot of modeling on sort of the scale and the scope of effort that we need. Um, is that US-based? Is that international? You know, where do you see that? Where do you see where we are now and where we need to be based on your analysis? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, I, I, I would just repeat, emphasize what Kate said. This, I think this is a very valid pa um, panel. Looking at these industrial emissions is, is clearly a very important part of the problem. And so I think Ned has done a great job um, putting this paper out and then being able to address this. So uh, yeah, from our perspective, I was a uh, manager research scientist within the Department of Energy National Labs for 15 years. And then we started this, um, this new startup, Carbon Solutions LLC. And we have six employees, five employees right now. And we do a range of things. We have wind and geothermal and some other low carbon energy we look at. But our main bread and butter is CCS, CO2 capture and storage, um, and really kind of the unique aspect that, that we're aiming at, what we're passionate about at, passionate about, and what we think we're the world's best at, is really trying to understand what CCS might look like at scale. Um, so really trying to understand both kind of the regionality aspect, which comes out in, in that as white paper, um, but the scale and how you get up to it. So for example, if we really are serious about um, having CCS be a meaningful part of the discussion here to help us reach that new target that we have in the, in the US right now, getting to 50% or just over reduction in CO2 by 2030 over the 2005 levels. CCS is going to be a really important part for this and across all of these um, uh, kind of these industries and these sectors. So both, you know, here looking at chemicals and metals and minerals and uh, paper and pulp board, but also looking, we've had it already, Kate, Kate said this already, looking at transport and power and fuel, having to look at everything. Um, uh, and when we talk about scale and regionality of what this infrastructure might look like, one of the things I think I would really like to emphasize is kind of the interconnectivity. And so in Nada's white paper, he was looking at uh, electrification and zero carbon hydrogen and CCS. And in some ways, you know, these are kind of standalone technologies, but if we're serious about getting to our targets, we're gonna start looking at uh, uh, the feedback. So for example, uh, for electrification, decarbonize electricity to be in there, you're probably gonna be looking at hydrogen and CCS in the mix. I think Nader's paper was looking more at zero carbon hydrogen in terms of um, sort of electrolysis. But once we start looking at, in addition to the green hydrogen, looking at blue hydrogen, so hydrogen from fossil fuels with CCS, uh, you start to see how the CCS link comes in. And so what we're focused on, our part, uh, and I think what could be really important for the question here and the problem here is um, trying to support policy and actual industry, how they do this. So from the policy perspective, we know we want to get to, let's say a billion tons a year. So we have this idea we call gigaton one, what would CCS look like to get us up to the billion ton a year, the gigaton one? And we know there isn't just one answer to this, right? There are hundreds of different 
pathways to get there based on based on policy, based on technology, based on what industry wants to do. Um, all these different sectors, how they interplay. There's lots of pathways to get there. How do you, you know, what does that gigaton level, billion ton level CCS infrastructure uh, look like? So that's really from a policy perspective. Um, but the other thing we do is really looking at, at the end of the day, industry is going to have to do this. And we know if we want to get to these um, pretty exciting targets, we know it's not going to be one source of CO2, one sink connected by one pipeline. Yeah, that will get us so far, but it isn't going to get us to the hundreds of millions of tons level of CO2 or the billion ton level. Um, and so what we're really interested in is helping industry uh, uh, kind of get over that hump. Uh, maybe that is where you have some small industries. It could be biorefined. It could actually be a lot of this. It could be the chemicals and minerals, and pay. they're not quite big enough on their own to do this. How do you bring them together to get over the technology hump, to get the economies of scale uh, to do that? So they're the kind of tools that we're interested in providing, uh, and a lot of it is the best data. That, you know, if you look at Nada's paper, he has some. Um, maps of the saline aquifers coming from the Department of Energy. What we're really focused on is developing tools and data to improve that information. The idea being if you're an industry and you go to somebody, maybe you come to Carbon Solutions, you say, I have the source, please tell me about where I could be storing my CO2. The one way you do that is by having the best possible data, or we would say the best possible information information to help that. So I guess a little bit rambling, but I would finish up by saying we're very interested in the policy side. I think you have to do that if you want to reach the gigaton level, meaningful levels of CCS, um, but also on the industry side. Industry does need help. They need the best tools. They need the best data. I think one of the questions in the, the Q&A was focused at that as well, of how do you get, you know, industry could be fairly risk averse. How do you get them to take that uh, jump to making, to making that happen? Thank you so much, Richard. I, I don't want to wander too much into the debate about what counts as infrastructure, but there, there's, a, there's a part of physical infrastructure and then there's some knowledge infrastructure that you were mentioning here, right? That we support the sectors, but then that cross-sectoral partnerships can be supported by sort of key expertise and knowledge availability and sharing that I think is a really important point going to shift. We're talking policy. So that means that Spencer is up. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking, we've discussed geographic mm -hmm. scale, sectoral scale, saying a lot of regional, but for the most part, when we think about policy, we think state or national. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how you see these interacting in the coming years? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, Liza. It's great to be here. Um, also great to follow such uh, awesome panelists as well who've already covered a lot of the different bases. Um, you know, I, I really appreciated that, that that Kate laid out that there's a large number of different sectoral issues and that each of the different issues for each technology is very different. Um, and I think due to that, there's also a bunch of different policy options that are out there, uh, both on a federal and a state level. There's a bunch of different levers that you can pull. Um, those range from research and development to lower the cost of technology to regulations, uh, procurement, um, supply side incentives, and then supporting infrastructure. And you're going to need a mix of these different policies for each of the different technologies. And some technologies are going to need more of one than another. Um, on a federal level, um, ClearPath has been really focused on trying to push on the R&D side, um, because of course the federal government is one of the largest supporters of research and development funding for clean energy technologies. Um, and then um, it's one other thing that we've been really looking at is trying, trying to find some of these supply side tax incentives like the 45Q um, carbon capture tax credit. Um, so if you think about on the, on the federal side, um, it's more of a blunt instrument trying to create an environment in which different technologies can, um, can succeed. Versus on a state side, you can be much more granular on an individual project basis. Um, and from that front, I think things like clean procurement can be a much more useful granular tool um, for, for states to use. So for example, I know that there's a, a, a really interesting bill um, in New York called LECLA, the Low Embodied Clean Concrete Act, uh, which, would give, uh, which would give preference to um, contracts for um, 
for roads or for construction that are using more clean sources of concrete with lower emissions. Um, California has a buy clean standard as well that doesn't apply to concrete or cement, but does apply to steel. Um, when you think about the, the physical purchase of a lot of these uh, materials from the industrial sector, it's, I believe, 90% of the use of concrete is for um, state or federal purposes, 50% of steel. So there's a really interesting opportunity there. And it makes a lot of sense to do more of the procurement on a state level and then think about what is the larger policy apparatus in which these companies are operating from a federal level, because you don't want to have um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of leakage between states or between regions. So that's kind of how I, how I break apart those two. Thanks, Spencer. I want to uh, talk a little bit about this, this clean procurement and what standards could be set, and particularly how quickly they could be met. So uh, there were some discussion in the news about the International Energy Agency recently had a report on what it would take to decarbonize. Um, and there was some question around, do we have the technology today? What did this mm -hmm. report say about whether we have the technology today? And what does that mean about our path forward? So if you, I think you know what I'm talking about. So if you yeah, can provide yeah, yeah. a quick clarification about what the report says, but then also some interpretation on, on what the technical readiness of some of these solutions means for whether we can have some of these procurement rules in right. place soon or not. Yeah. I think it was, uh, there was some criticism of, uh, of John Kerry uh, for, for, for citing that study. What the, the study was, was a focus on the role of energy innovation in meeting our climate targets. Um, and they were looking at on a global scale, all the various technologies are gonna be necessary to get to net zero emissions economy wide. And they found that um, uh, almost a majority of the technologies that are necessary, um, are not yet at a commercially mature stage. So they were in demonstration or they were in prototype, um, not quite saying that they're not available at all. It means that we need to spend significant um, money to try and accelerate the development of these technologies. And I think that's particularly the case um, in the industrial sector. Um, we need to spend more time and effort in demonstrating new technologies that are lower emission. Um, in that sector. And then what was your, what was your follow-up? No, I think you've covered it, right? It, yeah. it was those questions, right? Is, is clarifying the statement and then also what are the implications of what was actually in this report? Yeah. And you have to meet, um, you have to meet each sector where it is. So the cost of a clean alternative is going to be very different in steel than it is in trying to decarbonize cement than it is in chemicals. Um, so that can make some of the clean procurement a little bit more difficult. Because saying, oh, we need to have 20% procurement of clean in this sector versus this sector could mean a very, a very big difference in the actual technical feasibility of getting there, as well as the, the added cost of that material. So it, it starts to get really complicated unless you, unless you really break it down sector by sector. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I want to get into some of these details. And I'm going to... Uh, Nader ask you to talk a little bit about the technology, staying at a high level if, if you can. But you know, I, I have two questions. And one is why is why aren't we just electrifying everything? That why isn't that the solution? Why can't we just hook everything up to the grid? What are the pieces um, that mean that we have to bring in these other technologies? Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So in terms of electrification, I think it, it does speak a lot to what uh, Spencer was just uh, talking about, is that we still um, don't, we're not ready in terms of the technology for electrification uh, to meet the sort of high temperature heats a lot of industrial processes require, right? So the technology is lagging behind what the market really requires right now. So there's a, a, a still a long way to go in terms of, you know, basic R&D. Uh, so, you know, funding very early stage technologies that could perhaps meet that high temperature heat requirement through electricity, but also just kind of moving pilot phase technology such as CCS in, into the market. So I think in the, in the case of electrification, it really is just the technology isn't where it needs to be in order to, you know, uh, meet the market demands of the, the, the requirements of the, the kind of commodities we're, we're looking at in the sector. Great. Thank can you. I add to that real quick? I was actually just going to kick it to you, Kate. <laughs> Perfect. Please dive in. 
So he, Nader is 100% right. The, the, the high temperature heat piece is the, the wedge that's the hardest to solve in industry and completely aligned that investment in hydrogen, green hydrogen specifically, is going to be really necessary here. I think that shouldn't let us sort of look beyond the near term opportunity to address natural gas, um, which is used for high temperature heat in a lot of applications right now and has displaced coal um, due to the price of gas over the past several years. And as many of us know, there's been increasing pressure on the oil and gas industry to mitigate the methane emissions associated with with um, procurement of that gas, with uh, you know exploration, um, production, transmission, and then distribution of that gas. So I think that we're going to see, you know, in the next five years, a real movement toward <laughs> those who are pre procuring large quantities of gas to really be putting pressure on the oil and gas supply chain to bring those emissions down and to prove it, right? Um, via supply chain traceability protocols, um, product standards. Um, there's something called MIQ that RMI had a hand in developing. That's a standard for lower methane emission gas. But I think that in the near term, that is a really good place for companies to look as we stand up and make available larger supplies of, of all flavors of hydrogen, but green hydrogen in particular. Great. And uh, does someone want to, I think Richard covered this briefly, but does someone just want to run down the hydrogen rainbow for us here? We've got blue, we've got green, we've got gray. Can we put it all in one place? Where do they fit? Richard, you should cover the hydrogen. Yeah, I'll go. But I think Spence will be more insightful. I mean, look, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, uh, Nada's paper and um, what Kate was talking about, green hydrogen from renewable sources, electrolysis, spinning water, um, is kind of the, the holy grail because of the CO2 footprint. Um, and that's a great way to uh, decarbonize a range of industries, but, uh, particularly those that do have the need for high temperature, which is uh, very hard to displace with electricity and renewable electricity. Um, for CCS, and I should have explained when I threw this out, CO2 capture and storage, um, that's where blue hydrogen comes into play, and maybe it's more of a bridging solution or a short-term solution. The blue hydrogen is probably you know, I don't remember the late, latest numbers, but maybe half the cost of green hydrogen. And so it might be a way of jump starting uh, hydrogen economy. And that's certainly how we've started to look, look at it. And obviously we're somewhat parochial that we have a lot of CCS, CO2 capture tools and data. And so we wanna see where uh, blue hydrogen uh, fits in. And, and there was a question in the, the chat box. I, I, you know, I didn't have the greatest answer, but you know, trying to blue hydrogen difference between coal and natural gas. They have a different CO2 footprint and therefore you have different amount of CO2 to be captured and differential pack, um, impact on, on tax credits. And maybe it's a different conversation, but sometimes I do wonder if tax credits don't do exactly what you think they would like to do, right? 45Q is somewhat climate agnostic. You could produce a new industry to you can produce more CO2 emissions to capture CO2 somewhere else, but maybe that will change. So to so green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen being if you just take it from a fossil source, uh, usually 80% around natural gas, and you don't mitigate the CO2 emissions, that's what we might call gray hydrogen, but I also see it from coal being called black and brown hydrogen. Um, whether it's from bitumous coal, which I think is the black and more uh, lignite coal, which is um, uh, brown. So that's kind of the, the hydrogen piece. And I think could, could probably I, have something. Could I add that. one more? Yes. It's sometimes called pink hydrogen or purple hydrogen, but it's from nuclear energy. Um, and it can be produced either with low temperature standard electrolysis like green hydrogen, or you can do high temperature electrolysis, which is much more efficient. And there are a number of different demonstration projects being funded by the Department of Energy right now to try to switch some uh, nuclear plants to producing hydrogen as a more economic revenue source than, than electricity. I will be confirming all of these colors on Google after the webinar. That is even more hydrogen options than I realized. Um, I, you know, there's a couple of things that have been coming up in discussion that I, that I wanna make sure we talk about, which is the, you know, Richard had talked about the integration and the, and the connection between these things, but these solutions also, each technical solution seems to have multiple technical pieces that need to be figured out. Right, so there's producing hydrogen through 
I don't know, 31 different ways of producing hydrogen. But then there's also how we then use the hydrogen in, in, a, in a replacement process for industry. Similarly with carbon capture, there's technology for capturing carbon, but then there's also infrastructure and technology for storing and sequestering that carbon. That's a lot of pieces to tackle. Uh, Spencer, you talked a little bit about 45Q, but I do think there's been more policy ideas out there and even passed in legislation. I wanna say in the Energy Act of 2020, for example, could you talk about how we already have some, some policies and legislation that's starting to tackle these questions? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, in the omnibus appropriations bill that was enacted in December, um, uh, sorry, I should also mention that uh, before I was at ClearPath, I was working on the Energy Natural Resources Committee for uh, the chair Chairman Murkowski um, last year at that time. Um, we put together a comprehensive package of reauthorization of clean energy research and development programs of the Department of Energy. And we had a bunch of different uh, aspects of industrial energy technologies. Um, some of the biggest ones um, were expanding the loan program office to include industrial decarbonization technologies. Um, we also have a, a very large carbon capture demonstration program that specifically includes industrial decarbonization demos for carbon capture. Um, and then one of the biggest ones was a, a bill that we included from Senator Whitehouse called the Clean Industrial Technologies Act that establishes a comprehensive industrial decarbonization research and development program with a bunch of different focus areas on different processes and different technologies. Um, it also has a big focus on demonstration and on technical assistance and advisory council, but it's, it's quite a lot. Um, I think we'll see funding for these programs start to roll out this year. Um, I expect it will be in the budget request and um, the appropriations committees are very excited about funding these programs. So I think we'll see a lot more funding for, for demonstrating some of these new technologies. Um, one other thing that was also included um, was a phase out of hydrofluorocarbons, um, which are a, a gas that's used in refrigerants. Um, that's going to be phased out uh, by 85% uh, over the next 15 years or so. Um, so EPA is already promulgating a rulemaking for that too. Um, and there was also a two-year extension of the 45Q tax credit. So there's a lot that was enacted in, in December, and there's a lot more that, that's on deck too. So I think we'll start to see the impacts of that over the next year. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that rundown. And I think Kate had mentioned some of those, some of it, it mentioned in her intro, the policy opportunity that is here uh, to be tackling that. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got maybe one or two more questions, really just one more question I think we have time for, and then I'm gonna ask every panelist to just give their kind of final thoughts on this. We've got five minutes to solve industrial emissions. Uh, but first I wanted to ask Kate, we're talking a lot about investment, about investment in R&D, about investment in deployment. We haven't really talked about strategy, right? We've talked about the decarbonization reason, right, the climate change driven reasons, but can you talk about why is it beneficial for the U.S. to be leaving in this? Like, what is, what is the, the value strategically uh, for us to be leaders in low carbon manufacturing? Well, I think we have lived the experience of manufacturing of renewable energy, <laughs> right, um, and the competitiveness between the U.S. and China on that, and we've seen who has sort of won that. Right, <laughs> So we have a real opportunity here to take the lead in a number of different industries that are not only key to the US economy, but that everyone relies upon the US for. I'm from Texas originally and talk about an enormous opportunity on the Gulf Coast with that industrial cluster to lead on hydrogen. It's an extraordinary opportunity. Everyone in the world is looking for hydrogen right now they have a huge concentrated renewable energy resource there as well. And so I think this is a really transformational moment that we have the opportunity to seize upon in the US. So I'd say hydrogen is a huge opportunity for the US right now. I also think in terms of some of the materials that we commonly use in the built environment, the US also has an opportunity to lead. So thinking about the manufacture of green steel, um, green concrete and cement, and how we can move those forward and really serve as an example 
um, for other geographies that are really building out a lot of infrastructure at the same time as we are. Could I just add um, a quick comment uh, for, you know, Kate, I, I agree 100%. And another area where I think All right, looks like we've got a little bit of an internet snafu because that is life these days. So while we're waiting for Nader to come back on, uh, Richard, do you, can you share some sort of final thoughts for the, for the panel and for the audience on industrial emissions and how we tackle it? Yeah, I'll be really quick. I just want to throw out two thoughts that I didn't talk about that are increasingly important, I think. And the first is, the timeline to get to that 50% reduction is what, eight and a half years? That's a really short timeline and we have to change a lot of the economy and how that goes. And so I think it's really worth emphasizing that timeline. And there was a question in the chat box about emphasizing carbon pricing. And you know, this seems like a great way to, I mean, eight years, where some of these projects probably take five years or more from beginning to end. Eight years is a really tight timeline. Uh, so I think that's really important to bring up how we're going to do that, let alone when we get to 2050 with net zero. Uh, and the second thing that I wanted to mention really quickly was, and it's something the Department of Energy I hear is focusing on much more heavily now, is, is things like um, energy equity or environmental justice. That as we accelerate to do, I mean, doing this in eight years is pretty darn amazing, um, but making sure we do it in the right way. So we're not just focused on reducing the CO2 emissions, but making sure we're not disproportionately impacting parts of society that have been disproportionately impacted in the past. And so that's something we're trying to, we don't have it right now. We've done a little bit of work, but you know, this is a pretty big economic and energy and infrastructure change we're about to go through. And I think Kate was bringing, you know, bringing up the build back better and it's not almost so much build back, I don't think, right? It's more, we have to build really well going forward that we do the right thing, both you know, from energy, from climate, from society. Anyway, those two things I wanted to mention, the pretty rapid timeline and doing this correctly, taking into account things like environmental justice. Yeah, that's a great point. We didn't talk too much about some of these economic implications, but that is certainly one of them, the economic and place-based aspects of environmental justice. Uh, beyond just when we think regional sectoral um, aspects of decarbonization. Spencer, do you have uh, any final thoughts to share with us uh, be before, we, uh, before we break? Um, you know, I would say there's a lot to be done and especially considering, um, considering where we are from a political perspective in Washington, I, I wanna always reemphasize that there is a lot of room for bipartisanship on this issue, especially when it comes to trying to push new technologies out the door and get demonstrations. Um, you know, a lot of Republicans in Congress are very concerned about continued decline of the industrial sector, and especially with um, you know, carbon border adjustments on the horizon in the EU, potentially, I think there's more and more interest in trying to find ways to make sure that the US is as competitive as possible. Um, so I, we're, we work with a lot of members um, and there are a lot of uh, new interesting proposals that are probably going to be rolled out here over the next couple of months regarding individual sectors. Um, so pay attention to what's happening there and, and look at industrial decarbonization as a place where there can be a lot of bipartisanship. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Kate, final thoughts from the panel. Kate, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share about uh, the opportunities for, uh, for industry here as we wrap up and how to make this change happen? All right, thank you all uh, for a really wonderful panel. I dropped the link to Nader's paper in the chat. Uh, highly recommend checking it out. If nothing else, even more beautiful pictures that uh, I think multiple people highlighted really help put this conversation in context. Really appreciate the expertise on the time on the panel today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thank you.